How can Russia win? <laughs> it's no laughing matter, but that is not a video title I had envisioned working on at the start of this conflict, as the near universal consensus was that no matter how bravely Ukraine fought, they would never be able to stand up to the sheer material and numerical superiority of Russia. And yet, they have managed just that. It's very possible that their heroic resistance may go down in the history books. And in light of that, I figured it'd be interesting to have a look at the opposition perspective. Though before I even begin to try to answer the question, how can Russia win, allow me a moment to cover my ass here. I have no dog in this fight. My opinion from day one remains unchanged. Everyone would have been better off without this war, and now I simply hope it ends as soon as possible with as few soldiers' lives wasted as possible. But it did happen, and it is happening. So, since I am a massive fan of military history, I am going to talk about it. And since I've already done a video showing a theoretical battle plan on how Ukraine could win the war, a battle plan the Ukrainian army is currently in the middle of executing, by the way, which has not at all made me insufferably smug or anything. <laughs> I figured it'd be only fair that we have a look at the Russian Federation Armed Forces position as well, and how they can potentially regain control of a war quickly spiraling out of their control. In brief, Russia's lightning offensive, which it initiated the war with, was not at all a bad plan. In fact, from what we have been able to piece together of what was their operational idea to begin with, it seemed on paper to be a very solid offensive plan. Large territories in Ukraine would be seized quickly, Kyiv would be surrounded, and large elements of the Ukrainian army would be cut off and surrounded in the Donbass-Luhansk border. However, the execution of this plan fell well short of expectations, through a combination of poor Russian logistics, communication, and extraordinary Ukrainian resistance. The initial Russian plan is long gone, and the invader must realize that, dig in and drag the Ukrainian army back down into the mud where it can be strangled with sheer, overwhelming, unfair power. And to do that, the most immediate and broad measure to be instituted already seems to be on the mind of the Russian High Command, namely an immediate cessation of nearly all offensive operations as the army simply is not able to achieve forward momentum, and it certainly is not able to sustain it. The sole exception to this halt to aggressive maneuvers is right here, to the north of Kiev, where several reports suggest the Ukrainians have successfully begun pushing the Russians back from Kiev. But far more dangerously, they are also pushing in from Makarev, Piskivka, and Tetrovska. Precisely how extensive and how far these Ukrainian forces have gotten is a very difficult thing to discern right now, but it is possible they have already reached one of the two main roads leading in towards Kiev, with suggestions of fighting in the Chernobyl exclusion zone area. This is pretty much precisely the scenario I pointed out in my How Ukraine Can Win video. The Russian army cannot let the Ukrainians take Ivankiv or cut it off from the north. If it falls, so does the entire supply route to Russian forces immediately north of Kiev. The only options here is either a full-scale retreat immediately honestly the most reasonable option at the moment considering the enormous risk to the 35th combined arms army, but there is probably no way Moskva is going to allow that, which means the 35th must aggressively defend itself and deny any further Ukrainian advances no matter the cost, not just because should they fail, thousands of Russian troops would be encircled and God alone knows how much heavy equipment, but because it would be a propaganda victory like no 
other. If Ukraine renders a Russian combined arms army combat ineffective, weak and scattered, well, suffice to say, there are a lot of politicians and military leaders in NATO and the West in general right now begging for an excuse. And weakness? That's not just an excuse. That is a provocation. But with the immediate fire alarm fire addressed, let's lay some groundwork here. Normally, I would want to go up and down the line trying to figure out what units are where and what their strengths might be and how to use them, as this would be the absolute fundament for any kind of real theory crafting. However, these are unusual times, and beyond addressing major formations when and as needed, we won't go into too much detail on what unit is where simply because after a month of fighting and apparent heavy losses, even if we knew a brigade to be here or a division there, we have no way of knowing what state it is in. And so for right now, I suspect taking a full tally of Russian forces would probably serve only to create a false sense of strength, when the reality on the ground appears to be anything but. So let us instead take the 10,000 feet view. To the north of Kiev, we have the 35th Combined Arms Army in danger of getting cut off, and to its rear and flank, the 36th Army. There are also reports of elements of the 5th and 29th Combined Arms Armies, previously assumed to be in reserve in Belorussia, now beginning to move up to the front line, and not a minute too early either. One of the key uh, problems previously was that the logistical situation north of Kiev was struggling to keep up with one army, never mind two or three or four, but with the catastrophe so close to unfolding, any and all reinforcements that can be thrown into the fighting is probably going to have to be thrown in. To the east, the 2nd Guards Combined Arms Army and the 41st Combined Arms Army has been getting slowly pushed back from Kiev, while trying to maintain and reduce a series of Ukrainian pockets to its rear. Fierce fighting continues in these pockets, and it is unclear if the Russian forces are making much if any headway, or if they have been able to fully encircle and isolate all of these troops. The situation repeats in the area controlled by the 1st Guards Tank Army, where the city of Kharkiv has been surrounded at least in part for nearly a month now, and repeated heavy clashes are reported nearly every day, yet Ukrainian resistance appears to remain determined. In fact, recently I have seen suggestions that a major Russian rout may be happening in the area suggesting that Ukrainian forces have liberated significant areas around Kharkiv and may have re-established full contact with the city, and there are even some suggestions that they have pushed the Russians all the way back to the original border. But all of this is rather hazy. Along the Luhansk-Donetsk border, we have the heaviest large-scale fighting, with the 6th, 8th and 20th combined arms armies alongside several army corps. Despite the apparent disparity in forces, with all of these Russian formations up against 3 to 4 Ukrainian brigades, the fighting in the area has remained almost entirely static. On a couple of occasions, the Russians have made gains to the north and the south, but they have never been in any real danger of completing the Luhansk Donetsk Kettle. And finally, we have the 58th Combined Arms Army to the south in Crimea, along with several attached divisions and brigade level formations. This includes the 7th Guards VDV and Elite Naval Infantry. Now, with the big picture in mind, let us get a pinch more granular. Before the invasion, the Northern Advance had 4 to 6 battalion tactical groups, the Kharkiv Front 6 to 8, the Luhansk Donbas Front 12 to 16, and the Crimean Front 6 to 7. If you are wondering what a battalion tactical group is, I suggest you look up last week's video on it for proper details. But for the purposes of this video, however, suffice to say, they are the most immediately effective formations in the Russian army. 
They do, however, have some pretty serious flaws, one of which was mentioned in the BTG video is the lack of long-term staying power. So again, only God and the birds know what state these BTGs are in now. Regardless, however, they must be regrouped and brought back online as soon as possible, as they will be invaluable for the next stage of the war, which I break into four key points. Number one, a halt to casualties in men and material. Number two, morale, increasing Russian morale and reducing Ukrainian. Number three, international de-escalation. And number four, something fancy. Consider this one a bonus objective, we'll get to that when we get to it. The first one is obvious enough. Russia has severely underestimated Ukraine. They are not up against the Ukrainian army of 2014, a force that used outdated tactics and weaponry from the Cold War, poorly organized and led by hesitant and amateurish leaders. In 2022, after nearly a decade of advanced infantry weapons training and modernization programs overseen by Western instructors, the Ukrainian army is a very different beast. A lesson the Russian army has learned at far too high a cost. That needs to stop. To tweet. No more western style shock and awe offensives, no more miles long convoys waiting for their turn at the pinprick front line for a breakthrough that never happens. It is time to reject modernity and embrace tradition, to throw out the American and bring in the German. Specifically the commander of the 6th Panzer Division of World War II, Erhard Raus and his concept of a snail's war. Ironically, this idea came about on the Eastern Front. Granted, a fair old bit north of where the two parties are fighting currently, but nevertheless, Raus, at the time in temporary command of the 6th Panzer Division, found himself opposite a massive force of Soviet troops, rapidly entrenching themselves and displaying the Red Army's remarkable talent for turning simple mud, logs and shrubbery into massive complex systems of trenches, improvised bunkers and concealed positions. Realizing there would be no quick victory here, at least not without exorbitant cost to his men, Raus had his officers plan out in excruciating detail tiny little mini operations, where objectives like a specific bunker or a trench line or a hill would be scouted out, measured, considered, and finally taken in masterfully organized assaults utilizing every tool at the Germans' disposal. Infantry, artillery, mortars, heavy machine guns, engineers, tanks and assault guns all interwoven to an obsessive degree that saw seemingly impenetrable complex series of fortifications taken one objective at a time, slowly strangling the entire line with minimal and sometimes literally no loss to the attacker. It was war at its absolutely most unfair. The resources of a division apply to the taking of a hundred meters of terrain, and then another hundred meters of terrain, and then another, and then another. It wasn't fast, but it was exceptionally one-sided. And that is precisely what modern war is all about being as unfair to the opposition as humanly possible. Now, I'm not going to suggest that the Russian army of today try to replicate Raus to quite that degree, but the spirit of the snail's war absolutely applies. The hope of the swift knockout victory is long gone, and it is time to stop bleeding resources in the pursuit of it. So, first and foremost, the Russian army must move off the roads. They have been so limited to these roads up until now, controlling very little territory around them, and it has been a smorgasbord for the defender, picking off long, strung-out supply lines and lone armored vehicles moving through unsecured and uncontrolled territory. 
wherever possible, the front line should be extended away from the roads, creating security zones. If this means that the Russian army needs to retreat 10, 20, 30 kilometers to be sure of its lines, then it needs to be done because it simply cannot tolerate this kind of continuous strain. Not even necessarily so much to their men or their equipment reserves, but to their morale. These extended front lines should then be solidified with active patrolling to keep Ukrainian forces from infiltrating the Russian rear lines, something the Ukrainians have proven very adept at and already did prove adept at during 2014, when the 95th Air Assault Brigade carried out a weeks long raid behind enemy lines in Donetsk. Once the immediate front is secured, the area patrol should then be expanded, with the aim being to place the roads well out of reach of infiltrating elements and provide a nice safety zone for Russian support equipment to operate in. Mobile radar, AA, artillery, etc. etc. This may require some attacking on the part of the Russian army, but it will mostly be aimed towards its own flanks and rear areas, with the aim to widen and secure operational space rather than a full-blown offensive. And if the option is between attacking heavily entrenched Ukrainian positions or simply falling back a few kilometers, then retreating is right now by far the best option. Now, these patrols to expand the territory and to initially solidify it should be given wherever possible to the most trained and motivated troops available. Even if these must be organized into ad hoc formations, this is fine, as the focus should be on gathering up as many effective soldiers as possible and facilitating their operations with whatever support is available. Also, these patrols aim that taking territory should only be done at night, as the Russian army probably still has some pretty serious NV superiority, especially if they pool their resources into small ad hoc formations. When it comes to maintaining control over large areas of the front line while spread out and decentralized during the day, modern equipment gives a lot of vision range, and any movement of any sizable Ukrainian force should be easily detectable. Once space has been secured and thoroughly swept and reswept, attrition should begin to settle down quite a bit, completing point number one allowing us to move on to number two, improving morale and reducing Ukrainian morale. Right now, the Russian army is demoralized and frightened, to the point where there are even some rumors going around that Russians have found way to get rid of annoying superior officers insisting on further attacks whilst the Ukrainian army is buoyed up on a wave of absolute self-confidence and bold beyond belief. It will be very difficult to reverse this position, but perhaps not impossible. Step one has already been taken by attempting to reduce the rate of attrition, preventing the Ukrainian forces from scoring countless cheap and easy yet telling and significant victories. The image of a burning Russian tank might not have a whole lot of effect on the overall war effort. Russia has a lot of tanks, potentially tens of thousands if they open up the old armories, but it is a tremendous morale boost. And for the Russian side, simply not losing isn't going to cut it either, as they need to regain the morale they have already lost. Fortunately, the Russian Federation's armed forces has what is on paper the perfect tool for the task, the Battalion Tactical Group. This small and compact troop composition boasts firepower equal to a formation three times its size, and is ideally suited to the Snail War Doctrine. There are even easy targets right on hand for them to begin reducing to score telling moral victories. In the operational area of the 2nd Guards Tank Army and the 41st Combined Arms Army, there are several enveloped clusters of Ukrainian Army and National Guard forces, 
These venomous little pustules have undoubtedly already done a lot of damage to Russian logistics, and by all rights should have been dealt with weeks ago, but the invading army was set on a quick victory and simply passed them by. Now, that mistake must be rectified. Whilst maintaining as complete a front line as terrain and troop numbers allow, the duty of patrolling should be moved as much as possible over onto the more unreliable troops to free up the rest for the BTG's personnel. And now it is time for the mud. War at its most careless and brutal. No glory, no heroic struggles, just blood and shit. And I say that specifically to point out that what I'm about to suggest is not nice, not even particularly moral and certainly isn't humane, but the simple fact that we are currently trying to apply terms like nice, moral, or humane to war well, to me, it simply proves that far too many of us have completely forgotten what the word war means. So how is the BTG going to reduce these pockets and raise morale while doing so? They are simply going to apply the principles of the snail's war. Slow and steady movement into the encircled areas. One house, one block, one forest, one street at a time, whatever applies. They're all objectives, and each one must be seized with the maximum amount of preparation and force, applying the entire BTG's fire support asset against each and every flash of opposition gunfire. And I'm not joking, a sniper shot comes from the trees over there, pound it for 30 minutes with all nine guns of the BTG's attached artillery batteries. Somebody suspects fire to be coming from the huts over there, same deal, again and again and again, driving the defenders one step back every time. Until eventually you encounter a strong point, a position that cannot simply be reduced to rubble via artillery. Maybe it's a large housing block, for example, or a large office block, a major civic structure. These things can take a ludicrous amount of punishing without collapsing. In fact, in many cases, reducing them to rubble can actually improve the defender's position. And when it comes to deep basements of certain buildings, trying to break that apart with gunfire alone is next to impossible. Indeed, we've got some examples during the Luhansk Donetsk conflict, for example, where a airport facility was bombarded for weeks and weeks and weeks, and it did not shift the entrenched Ukrainian infantry one inch. When one of these objectives resistant to artillery fire is discovered, it should be approached just like the 6th Panzer did. The objective should be studied, measured, considered, thoroughly scouted, and then taken with the maximum application of unfair faults. This means attacking at night with night vision gear. It means using tanks and artillery for direct fire support. It means laying down suppressing fire on all nearby positions with full blast, blasting away no matter how many rounds are required. The Russian tank production might be stopping up due to the problem of importing certain high-tech parts, but production of good old-fashioned dumb ammunition and bullets is probably still going at full steam. And as I always say, better to waste ammunition than men. When the enemy is thoroughly suppressed by everything you can throw at them, Russian forces should finally move in and clear the objective room by room. Mr. Grenade goes in first, no matter what. No questions asked. If there's a room, the grenade goes in first. If that isn't enough, you bring up PK machine guns, you load armor-piercing ammunition, and you sweep the rooms through the walls one by one. If even that doesn't get the trick done, you bundle up grenades and you dump them like satchel charges through every door. Whatever is required to minimize casualties whilst maximizing destruction for the enemy. 
so long as local numerical and material superiority can be maintained, it is very difficult to defend against this kind of attacks, as it is the simple application of overwhelming force along with as much preparation and planning as possible. And just to make it clear as well, this is an incredibly brutal and horrible way to wage war. Collateral damage is not just a side effect, it is an intended purpose of this kind of war. But again, it is war. And neither side is pulling any punches. This is also, to some extent, what is already happening in Mariupol. But there seems to be... Well, it appears less like a deliberate choice and more a simple consequence of the city having been encircled quite early on, as the main Russian offensives in the area continue to the north rather than focusing on the city. And in theory, that was the better option for Russia. They would have been much better off if they had actually completed the Donetsk-Luhansk pocket than if they were simply to focus all of their efforts on besieging Mariupol. But after two failed attempts, again, that part of the war is over. And now, it is more important to reduce a pocket of enemy resistance to the rear, as well as scoring a significant win for the Russian forces. So Mariupol will also be one of those objectives to be reduced by the battalion tactical groups. And this is both to boost the morale of the Russian forces by showing that yes, we can score victories and we can do so without massive losses, and to reduce Ukrainian morale by denying them easy targets, forcing them to carry out dangerous offensives if they want to try and save these encircled units, or force them to sit passively by whilst they are shelled and their comrades are attacked. Presuming that eventually these various pockets can be reduced, the battalion tactical groups will then be redeployed to the front line, where they are not going to be seizing necessarily objectives or terrain specifically, but they will be simply placed opposite whatever the Ukrainians have to defend so that, again, the BTGs can apply the Snail's War to reduce one objective at a time as unfairly and as overwhelmingly as possible, whilst also making sure that the Ukrainians aren't allowed to simply abandon the objective. Now, I suspect many of you might already be thinking, hold on, doesn't this go directly against point three, international de-escalation? Surely battering everything to dust, including civilian targets, won't be gaining the Russian state any friends in the international community. And yes, you are absolutely correct, but NATO has already made it clear through its inaction that civilian suffering is simply not enough to force a response beyond the purely economical and the sending of military resources to Ukraine. And sure, economic sanctions and military aid does hurt, absolutely, but this was going to happen regardless. It is a consequence that was unavoidable and was going to happen, and well, it has already happened. It is pointless to worry about it now. Sure, the economic sanctions will degrade the Russian economy. It will be a very nasty thing in the future. And that's the takeaway point. Sure, Russia's GDP might very well be halved in the next two to five years, and that's serious, but does Ukraine have two to five years? Does Russia? I don't know. But the point is that these sanctions will do something in the future, not now. And it is an unfortunate fact that the international community and the world in general has a short attention span. Today, every leader is promising to stop Russian oil and gas and Russian exports as a whole. But with skyrocketing prices on food, fuel, electricity, and a rarely before seen rate of inflation in the US, how long will the West stay tough? Again, I don't know, but what I do know is that Russia is bleeding money, prestige, and soldiers now today, not tomorrow, and must focus on its immediate problems first. So at the moment, the best way to de-escalate a confrontation with the West, since retreat and backing down is almost certainly not an option considering Moscow, is to push harder. Which 
might sound counterintuitive, and it is, but again, it is to push harder and smaller. Limited engagements, no big headlines or news, just a slow, grinding drudgery of war. No big offensives, no remarkable acts, no huge defeats or massive piles of burning Russian armor, just a tiny trickle of bombardments, explosions heard here, explosions heard there. A few weeks of that and I would be happy to bet money on that the Western news medias will be back to talking about the new COVID Gamma Epsilon Theta Bunny variant. And then finally, number four, something fancy. This one really depends on what Russia's game plan is now. There has been a lot of talk from the Russian general staff that they totally weren't aiming to take Kiev and they totally weren't intending to take over the entirety of the Ukraine. No, no, no. It was all just a distraction, you see, from securing the Luhansk-Donetsk border because the Ukrainians had been bombing them, you must understand. Bullshit. <laughs> Those were no distractions, absolutely not. They were trying to knock Ukraine out of the war in a single massive blitzkrieg campaign. They failed, and they're now trying to cover for it rather poorly. What is Russia's new objective now? Well, taking Kiev is no longer an option. Surrounding it on day one and then taking it with the second guards combined arms army from the east was a good idea. I will not relinquish their position. It was a good idea but poorly executed and it must now be surrendered. The 35th is far too exposed. Pull back to the Belarusian border and reposition these troops to help push from the eastern side. Now there should be limited objectives, perhaps increasing the area of Luhansk Donetsk. Taking over half of Ukraine would certainly be a theoretical possibility, and something that would allow Russia to go, right, we've liberated the Russian speaking parts. Now we can now we can have peace. Because this is all we wanted, you see. Yes. Again, everyone is going to know it's bullshit. But bullshit from a politician's mouth is hardly rare or surprising. Whether or not the Russian army will be able to do that, take half of Ukraine, is a very different question, as they are undoubtedly beginning to wear their own supplies and resources a bit thin already, but so is probably Ukraine. So let's throw out some Number four, something fancy, something that Russia could do to begin pushing towards that halfway point in Ukraine, and specifically the Dnieper River. And now we are really just spitballing here. Uh, the naval invasion against Odessa is something that the Russians have been teasing, shall we say, for quite some time. I don't think it's a particularly good idea. It would be a huge gamble. If it fails, it would cost the Russians dearly. It would be an enormous propaganda victory for Ukraine. And even if they succeeded, all they would really do is potentially drag away forces from the Crimean front, a front that also has been checked quite thoroughly. The Odessa invasion in and of itself will probably not achieve all that much, but it might drag away enough troops for the Crimean fronts to start getting frisky again. If a potential push could be launched from the current Crimean position upwards to the Dnieper, things could get very, very dangerous for the Ukrainian forces on the Luhansk-Donetsk border very quickly. But this would be an enormous risk to take. Something a little bit more reasonable would instead be to again settle down, hunker down, and fortify, and then begin moving forces around. Right now, the Luhansk Donetsk border is heavily contested, and the Russian army is not making any real headway. So perhaps it is time to stop trying. Perhaps some of those formations can be peeled off. Perhaps additional reinforcements can be brought in from other areas of Russia. There are already suggestions that some of the Syrian troops have been redeployed. 
Perhaps the First Guard's army could really use those reinforcements for a renewed push towards the Dnieper. Perhaps even a second attempt against Kiev could be made. If enough battalion tactical groups could be placed on the outskirts of Kiev, that could force the Ukrainians to begin pulling back troops to defend the city, or alternatively could force them to launch repeated and presumably costly counterattacks to relieve it. And finally, something less fancy and more simply frightening is the fact that Russia has something that Ukraine does not. Nuclear weapons. Not strategic, mind you. I do not buy the ideas that Putin is dying and is crazy and is doing whatever to just be a crazy person. This is a silly way of thinking of things. Putin has been a cold and calculated leader all the way up until now. He has pulled off gambits again and again, simply assuming that he's crazy this time because this gambit didn't pull off is very, very silly. And strategic weaponry will not go unanswered. It can't go unanswered. It is the final frontier. But tactical weapons, that's one of those big what ifs. What would NATO do if Russia deployed a tactical nuke, a single tactical nuke against a large Ukrainian strongpoint, wiping out a brigade, say, for example, or a significant portion of a city. Because bear in mind, tactical nukes are nowhere near as powerful as strategics. It is the rough equivalent of a Hiroshima bomb, perhaps. Oh, it's big. It's going to cause massive devastation, massive casualties, but it's not going to level an entire city. It's not going to bring the entirety of Ukraine to its knees. But it would be a domination move, as I put it, to Artemis, as we were discussing this in DMs. Russia would do this and then simply lean back and say, All right, you wanted to defend your cities. This is how I decided to take your cities. Are we going to continue this war? What Ukraine would answer? Well, that's another big question. It is a bit of a nightmare scenario because no one knows what would happen. Would this be the one step too far for NATO? Would they immediately declare that they had to intervene? Would they dare? Would they dare risk being attacked by tactical nukes themselves? Would Russia as a nation even survive the deployment of a tactical nuke? Because that would probably guarantee that the sanctions against it would be permanent. And Russia is no longer in the self-sufficient position it once was as the Soviet Union. Even China would probably abandon it as an ally at that point. It would be a do or die moment, which might gain them victory in Ukraine and it might destroy their entire nation. But I figured I'd bring it up because everyone is talking about how this could totally turn into World War III. And I figured it was a good shocker to end the video. Until next time, I've been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.